and the kids are welcome to be dismissed to their classroom. All right, kids are welcome to be dismissed, and if you have a copy of God's Word, I'd invite you to open it up with me to Ephesians, and we'll be in chapter 3. So after the last couple weeks when we were enjoying our our Easter uh, services and our Easter sermons and series, uh, we are now back into our uh, course series, which is our Union with Christ uh, this really powerful truth that we uh, better understand. We're uh, going through very cautiously, carefully, uh, 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 slowly as we look through uh, these first three chapters specifically that uh, talk to this key principle of who we are in Christ, our new identity in Christ. So here we are in Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 13, and this is going to talk to our access in Christ, our access in Christ. So here we are, I'll read it through first one time, and that is Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone uh, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in, heavenly, in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he had realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Well, uh, to open us up and to kind of maybe get us in the right frame of mind, uh, 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 an idea or a, or a picture came to me when I was thinking about this text. Uh, and I was thinking about the movie, A Christmas Story. I know that this is totally the wrong time of year to be talking about this. I'm probably, you're probably getting ready to throw some tomatoes at me because we want to enjoy this beautiful weather out there. But I, but I have to think about it because this is what came to my mind. If you remember, uh, this story is focused on Ralphie. And Ralphie so desperately wants his Red Ryder BB gun for Christmas. And so Ralphie is... Uh, uh, at, at one point in the movie, Ralphie is so focused, he's stressed because he wants, he's going to approach Santa Claus with his request for his Red Rider BB gun. And so if you remember the scene, he's waiting in the line at the store, and of course this, this, this line, it kind of walks up this big plateau to, this, uh, to Santa who's on his, on his big chair and stuff, and so he's in the line and he's waiting, and this is, everything is riding on Ralphie getting to share his, his desperate wish with Santa Claus about this Red Rider BB gun. That's how he knows that he has a chance of getting it. And if he doesn't get to Santa to ask for it, then he knows he has no chance whatsoever. So he's in line, and the, and the pressure's building, and all of a sudden, over the intercom, it comes across that the store's closing, and so the time is now, and so he finally gets up there. He's going to be probably the last kid that's going to have the chance to make his request known to Santa Claus, and as he's sitting up there, and he gets, I mean, he's totally intimidated. He's, he's standing there, he's worried, and so they, they get him up, and they, you know, they grab him, ruffle, and set him on Santa's lap. Ho, 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 if you remember that part of that scene. And so he's sitting there, and he blanks out. And he, what do you want for Christmas, boy? And he goes blank. And he's sitting there, he, and, and you hear his inner monologue, which is really the star of the whole uh, movie. His inner monologue, my mind had gone blank Frantically, I tried to remember what it was that I wanted. I was blowing it. So Santa turns to him, and this kid with this blank look, and he says, do you want a football? And he sits there, and he just kind of gives this little nod and this blank look. And then he realizes that he blew it. And so the elf grabs him off Santa's lap and sends him down the little chute, right? 
All right, well, I think that in some ways that gives us a little picture as to in, in how we at times are approaching God. If we think about it, here's the creator of the universe. And when we come before the throne of God, I think that it's easy for us to have kind of that same intimidation where, oh my goodness, I, I, I see that I'm a sinful, uh, sinful person and, and, and here's God, the creator of all of the universe and creator of, of the stars and the heavens and creator of me. And here we are to approach God. And we can be so intimidated by that. But our text today talks to us about the boldness that we have before the throne of God. But again, we think about this, we're, we're nervous as we approach God when we think about Him, and, and again, there's a, definitely a layer of awe and wonder that we should have as we think of our Creator. Absolutely, we should. Well, again, this kind of came, I mean, I, th- I think that there's ways, in fact, you could read through your text of Scripture, and in some ways you'll find some sections in here that would kind of reinforce that idea. In fact, if you go back and, and read through uh, sections in Leviticus you will get some of that awe and wonder and nervousness and fear of the Lord. In Leviticus, there is when it references the Day of Atonement. This was the day, the one day each year that the the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and would make the sacrifice for the sins of first himself as the high priest and then the people. And of course, there was very specific instructions to the high priest, which is what we see in Leviticus. That's what uh, the, the, much of the book of Leviticus is, is the instructions for the Levit- Levitical priesthood in terms of what they should do, how they should approach God. And so there's very detailed instructions uh, around the ritual associated with this. So uh, they would go in and they would have to, uh, uh, first of all, the, the holy priest would have to bathe himself in a, in a certain way to cleanse himself. And then he would have to put on very specific holy garments. He would put on a holy linen coat and a holy sash and a holy turban and holy undergarments. He would put everything holy on himself. I mean, he, was, he had to be just completely decked out exactly the way that it was laid out that God had, had given instructions to the people to do. So they, were, they would follow these instructions in absolute perfect detail. And of course, they knew that if they came in unrighteous, in an unrighteous way, into the Holy of Holies, they knew that, they, that God would tear them down instantly. In fact, there's, there's a legend. We don't know if, it's, if, it's really, if it really happened or not. I'm a little skeptical personally. But there's a legend that the high priests would actually have ropes tied around their ankles when they would walk into the Holy of Holies. So that if, because nobody else could go in there, and so if they went in and they, were, uh, and they weren't appropriately cleansed and God just took them away instantly or, or they struck them down right there, that, it, that then the other priests could drag them out of the Holy of Holies because they had instantly been taken away. So that was, uh, that was the thought. And again, in, in some ways, there was some, uh, some right thinking associated with it. I mean, we should be. This is, this is God that has given this very specific prescription as to how to worship Him and, and, and what we should look like and who only should be walking into the Holy of Holies, which really was the great high priest. Uh, and, and I know that some of you might be thinking, well, that's fine, Pastor, but that was the Old Testament. That doesn't apl- apply to us any longer. Well, at the end of that section that gives all of those details uh, to, the, to the high priest in terms of uh, what he should be doing as he approaches uh, the Holy of Holies. And as he makes this uh, sacrifice, uh, we actually see in three different verses uh, this phrase, and it shall be a statute to you forever. In fact, later then uh, in verse 31, it is a statute forever. And finally, it's repeated a third time, and this shall be a statute forever for you that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all of their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. I mean, we get this picture that this was supposed to be something forever. I mean, so now are you thinking, are you sitting there thinking, well, wait a second. So 
Did God just not know that some of these things would eventually happen and to, that the nation of Israel would fall away? I mean, did, you, did, did, did God just expect that this would happen forever and it just didn't? I mean, what, what's going on there? Or should we be repeating these things right now? Uh, what's going on? How do we reconcile that? Well, what's important, the way that we can reconcile it, the way that it makes perfect sense, is to understand a key office of Jesus Christ and his fulfillment as our great high priest. Our great high priest. He serves as our great high priest. He enters the Holy of Holy. The key difference between Jesus Christ as our great high priest and the high priest that we see in the Levitical priesthood is, is that uh, Jesus Christ, our, our great high priest, as we sit here today, does not have to sacrifice a bull for his own sins. His sacrifice, when he goes in, he is the sacrifice that enters into the Holy of Holies that makes atonement for all of us. Uh, we see this in Hebrews. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, uh, spends great detail covering this idea of Jesus as our great high priest. Uh, just one section here, here's Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in which we are saying is this, we have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. It goes on to say, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. So Jesus is our great high priest. And, and there's a number of things that are interesting about this text that we have up there. Um, one of the things that I, I want to point out for you is, is that, you know, look around right now. And, and if you're looking for who is, the, who is the high priest, it's definitely not me. I am not your high priest. Uh, we don't have the high priests around us today. It would be wrong to appoint a high priest uh, for our church or anything like that because we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ is our high priest. In fact, in verse 1, and you see this, you, you see that it's a present and active verb. We have such a, such a high priest, one who is seated. He is seated. He was seated at the point that, uh, that the uh, book of Hebrews was written, and he's also seated there right now ministering as we sit here today. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. He functions in that role today. So we can uh, we sit underneath the great high priest who is Jesus Christ, um, and, and uh, we know uh, that we have confidence because he is our great high priest. One of the things that would have made the Jewish people a little nervous was is that what would have happened if their high priest in the Old Testament, if their Levitical, Leviticus, Leviticus priesthood uh, entered in, and if he wasn't, properly atoning for the sins of the people, then the sins would not have been atoned for. They would, not, they would still be on their shoulders. So they would have been nervous. Boy, I sure hope that the high priest uh, properly cleansed himself before he walked in. Boy, I sure hope that he cast lots and chose the right goat uh, to sacrifice when he's in there. Uh, the people would, of course, have been a little bit nervous. But that's one of the things that we don't have to be nervous about today. We have the perfect, great high priest. He serves as perfection in the Holy of Holies, making for our atonement right now. There is no need to offer anything for his own sin. He is able to walk into the Holy of Holies and, and uh, stand before God as our mediator, as our, as our great high priest. What a, what a tremendous and rich... Uh, concept that that is as we better understand it in scripture we also see in uh, in another section of hebrews in hebrews chapter 4 we see this in starting in verse 14 since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, is, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then in verse 16, we see this. 
Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Look at that language. That we can with confidence draw near. The picture that we see laid out in Scripture in the New Testament, the picture that we see that, that Paul has for us in our core text here in the book of Ephesians is not that we approach God with nervousness, with fear, with uncertainty. The picture that we see laid out here by Paul is, is that we are approaching God with confidence. That we, that we walk in, in boldness. And to be clear, church, this isn't a boldness based off of who we are. We are sinful in our own nature. But we are wrapped with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are made whole. We, when, when the Lord sees us, He sees the holiness and righteousness of His Son Jesus. And He sees perfection. And that's the boldness that we step before the throne of God. You know, I think about, uh, to continue the uh, illustration from, from the Christmas story, if you remember that part of the movie when, when little Ralphie gets sent down the chute, well, what does he do? Halfway down, he stops himself. He realizes his error, and he realizes that he, that he needs to, he wants to get out that, no, 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 Santa, you missed it. I, I failed it. You've got to hear the fact, you've got to hear me out. So he stops and he turns around and he starts climbing, clawing back up the slide to, to make his protest before Santa Claus. Now, of course, my illustration is going to fall flat here because then he gets a big boot in the face and he gets pushed down the slide. And that kind of, that kind of takes away the meaning of where I'm kind of going with this. But you know where I'm going. So we see that... that the boldness, that you know, that's the boldness that Ralphie had finally of going. He's like, no, he's done with the nervousness. He's going to climb back up and he's going to make his po protest before God. He's going to make his request boldly before Santa Claus. And, and if we could muster that same uh, boldness that we come before the throne of God. And again, it's not anything in and of ourselves. When we come before God with boldness, then we, will, uh, we, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to see uh, three things that we should be boldly proclaiming. So we should act boldly when we proclaim the following. In other words, we don't want to be nervous or tepid. We're not going to be hesitant when we think about these three things. The first one is this, that the church is central to history. The church is central to history. If you look at verse 10 in our core verse today. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Did you catch that, church? So that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. That's... Not through the pastor, not through some private epiphany, not through some individual thing. It's through the church. This is the message that's carried out uh, today. That's the plan. The plan is, is that the church is boldly proclaiming the message. Here's this open secret that we uh, have read. We, Paul has talked about that. We just looked at that. We'll look at it here in a second in, in a little bit more detail. But um, here is a new group of people. This is the open secret. There's a new group of people that are now uh, uh, standing at the feet of God. These new people, this new family, uh, they have shed their former selves and they have been reborn into a new ethnos, a new people group uh, that are now to make up the body of Christ. This new group of people, this new group of people aren't Jewish, they aren't Gentile, they aren't Americans, they aren't Canadians, they aren't Hawkeyes, they aren't Cyclones. Uh, they aren't stealers, they aren't cowboys, they are in Christ. In verse 10, we see this manifold wisdom. Do you see that manifold wisdom of God? Well, one of the ways that we can understand this manifold wisdom, what do they mean by that? In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this manif that word manifold was the same word that they used to describe Joseph's colored, uh, Joseph's technicolored dream coat. 
If you remember Joseph and he had this, uh, he was given this special coat of many colors. Well, they use the same word, this manifold uh, coat, this manifold colored coat. So we see these many colors. And that's the, that's the picture that Paul is trying to draw for us of the church. This manifold wisdom, this multicolored wisdom. Uh, the wisdom that uh, we are a multiracial, multinational, multigenerational church. We are the body of Christ. We are made up of proud Americans and proud Canadians. I don't know if there is such a thing. Proud Hawkeyes. I'm just joking. I love Canadian friends. Um, proud Hawkeyes and proud cycl- well, uh, Cyclones and former Jews and former Gentiles, former Muslims, former atheists, former secular materialists. I mean, all of these people, we all uh, were that, but we all now come to Christ as one united body of Jesus Christ. That is our new identity. When our Lord, when our Creator, when we stand before the Lord, uh, before His throne, He sees us in Christ. Maybe He sees some of those other attributes about us, but trust me, those are far below the fact that we are in Christ. That's what He sees. And when He sees that we are in Christ, He welcomes us in. We should boldly stand. We don't timidly stand before the throne of God because we are wearing the righteousness of Christ. Why would we be timid when we do that? We have put on the righteousness of Christ. When we are in Christ, we now have His righteousness. We should be speaking boldly. We should be acting boldly. And even before the throne of God. And again, we never do that on our own righteousness. We never knew, do that in Mark or in Sergio or in any of us individually. It's because we are in Christ. Notice we see a number of places in Scripture that, uh, that the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Uh, in Isaiah, we see, For behold, a new, uh, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, We also see, of course, one of the most famous texts in Scripture, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. There's this description of who we are in Christ, that we are eternal, that that we are bold and proud, and the old things have been cast away in the newness of the fact that we are in Christ. That is our identity. That is who we are. That is our boldness. The the church is central to history. We are now the body of Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ physically was here on earth 2,000 years ago, and He preached and He lived, and He lived in a perfect life, and He died on the cross. All of those things really happened. Uh, But his, His body is now the church. We are the body of Christ. And we are central to history. The second point uh, that we see from our text today is the fact that the church is central to the gospel. Now, our Bible translators kind of cleaned up some of the language uh, in our text today. Uh, Now, I know uh, you teachers here are going to need to kind of hold your ears. Uh, I'm going to use some language that's going to be really hard to hear. This is why we send the kids off out to the classroom. Uh, But in the original language, if you look at uh, verse 8, it says, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, well, Paul, in the original language, uses some really colorful language uh, in this section. Technically, he says, I'm the least of the leastists. I'm the lesser of the leastists. I'm the least of the lessers. He uses this really odd language in the original language that I'm sure people would have gone, what did you just say? Did you just make that up? I know, again, you teachers, you're probably, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. You're, good thing your kids aren't here. You'd be giving them earmuffs right now. Don't listen to this type of language. This is not what you should be saying at all. But it was. That's in the, in the original language. He's the littlest of the leastists. Now, uh, Paul's name tends to have this word little associated with it. That's kind of, there's a, there's a reference to Paul's name that he might be using in there. We don't know for sure. 
But again, he's, he's really trying to punch this home. He's trying to say, I am the, less, the least of the saints. He puts himself extremely low. And I know all of us, I sure think this, wow, if Paul's low, where am I? If Paul, who had the opportunity to be confronted by Jesus on the road, uh, on the road and, and, he, and he was completely transformed, and now he's preaching the gospel, and now he was in prison for, uh, for his work trying, trying to preach the gospel to, to the Gentiles. And if Paul was the least of the leastest, then who am I? But Paul connects this. Paul connects this to the gospel. Even though he is so low, he wants everybody to see the good news. And he wants everybody to see what God has done in himself. That he was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. It wasn't because of anything in him. It's to show off the glory of God. So he wants to point us to the good news. The good news, look at verse 7, of this gospel, of this good news, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Uh, This gospel that he's talking about is just pointing back to verse 6 right before that. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Paul sees such a deep connection to this mystery that has been revealed, that there is no longer Jew or Gentile, there is just those in Christ. The gospel message is is that we are all new. We are all new. We have shed the old and we are now new. We are a new creation in Christ. And, and that is an important part, that is intimately tied to the gospel message that Paul is wanting to share with the world. Now this is important because we know that this gospel message must go out to the world. I mean, we've talked about this in the Great Commission. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We know that that is the, the charge of the church is to... Uh, uh, is to bring the message. The gospel message is not only out to all of the people groups, which is what it is, but it also going out through all of the people groups. The gospel message goes not only to all the nations, but through all the nations, to all of the different people groups, through all of the different people groups. We, the church, we, the church, carry this gospel message, carry this gospel, uh, this, this good news that the world needs to see. And part of what they are seeing is the manifold wisdom of God, the multicolored wisdom of God. Not all of the Christians are going to look the same. Some are young, some are old, different color, different background. We might be wearing Hawkeye sweatshirts or gopher sweatshirts or Boilermaker sweatshirts, but we're all preaching. We're all sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. We all look different, but part of our witness to the world is the fact that all of these different people groups all have come together. They have united under one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation um, you, you walk home from church, or excuse me, I'm sorry, you walk home from work. You get home from work, you come in the door, and your lovely spouse is there, and hey, honey, welcome home. How was your day today? Oh, I had a tough day today. That dad, nab, boss of mine, you're about ready to start laying all of a sudden, then you realize, then, then your spouse says, the kids are right there. Oh, uh, well, yeah, my boss, I'm praying that he receives some grace from God. Uh, it was a kind of a difficult day. You know, have you ever been in that? So, so the audience will sometimes change how you react to things, right? And how you portray things. So if your kids are around, you're probably going to soften the message a little bit. You're probably going to scrub it a little bit. You're going to look a little differently when the kids are around, right? Well, part of what it, Paul is communicating in this section is, is that uh, we Uh, are being watched by not only the world, but really the universe. The whole universe is watching us, the church. 
When the, when the universe sees, when, when the non-believers in the world see, wow, look at this Christian church, look at what they are doing, the message that they, that they bring to us. I mean, that, that, that really calls people's attention. We are being watched. All eyes are on us. When we act as part of God's plan, when we act that out, this unbelievable story, we demonstrate God's manifold wisdom. And when we put our differences aside and love each other as family, God is glorified to the unbelievers and the heavenly hosts. Did you see that in verse 10? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The angels are watching us. Part of how God is glorifying Himself to the heavenly hosts is by having them watch us. There's an audience that's watching us. So, we should clean it up, right? So, we should act that way. We should realize that that a lot of eyes are on us. And when we do that, when we live it out, when we, the church... When we, the church of Jesus Christ, when we preach Jesus and live our lives according to Jesus, we proclaim loudly to a, to a massive audience beyond anything that we even understand. We, under, we, we proclaim the glory of God. Uh, the third point is this, that the church is central to Christian living. The church is central to Christian living. Now, I can go on a trip... I can leave and go on a trip and be gone for a couple of days, and I'm still married to my wife. Just because I'm physically not in the same room that she is doesn't mean that, that I'm no longer married to her. But if I go on a trip and I stay there and I stay there long enough and I keep staying there and I'm no longer with her and I'm, I'm just gone and I'm gone and I'm gone, at some point in time, I'm likely not to be married to her any longer, right? Right? Uh, in fact, I had a coworker, I had a co-worker, former coworker of mine, that had a job for many, many years, many decades. That uh, he was, uh, he had a job that he didn't travel very much at all. Had enjoyed a very happy marriage for many, all of those years. Uh, he got a new job where he traveled extensively, and sure enough, it was not that long after that job that he was divorced. They just weren't able to survive that separation. And I think that one of the things we have to understand, there's a parallel to us as Christians, we belong in a church. We belong to be in the body of Christ. Yes, as a Christian, can I survive outside of the body of Christ? Can I survive uh, being a Christian away from a church for a period of time? Of course I can. But at some point, if I've completely disconnected myself to the body of Christ, I've got to wonder. I've got to wonder whether, whether I was a Christian to begin with. We've got to understand the importance of us being connected to the body of Christ. You know, Paul, we understand, is suffering. Paul is writing this letter from prison. Um, he's, he's sending us out by this letter. They love him. Uh, the, the Ephesian church, he had spent uh, a good amount of time with the Ephesian church, and, and to hear that Paul was in prison, I'm sure it was tough for them to hear. I mean, for those of us that have been here for now more than a, few, a couple of years, uh, if you were here for uh, years ago, you'd know that uh, uh, my predecessor, uh, our uh, former pastor, lead pastor, Carlos, who's now out in California, well, we like to hear, I've, from time to time, you, one of you will even come and check in with me and say, hey, have you heard from Pastor Carlos? How's he doing? We want to know, how are they doing? How about Pastor Jamie in Minnesota? How's he doing? So I I know that we all, we all think about that. We have this, we have this, uh, we appreciate those that have been part of our church family and we want them to do well. And of course, uh, in Minnesota and in California, uh, as a pastor, uh, yeah, things, that, that could be some dangerous territory that they're in. And so I'm happy to report the latest that I've heard. They're both doing well and everything's good, so no worries there. And, and again, it's nice to hear that those that we've loved, that have been part of our church family, are, are doing well. And I'm sure that, uh, that the uh, receivers, the, the Ephesians that are listening to this letter and are hearing uh, that Paul is in prison, I'm sure that that's really turned them upside down. That's created an angst, a nervousness, a worry on their part. But he's saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I want you all to hear that I am well. 
So don't be sad. Paul's telling them, don't be sad that I'm suffering. Paul's been chosen to be a minister, to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. It's a glorious thing. This is an incredible message of this new union of Jew and Gentile into this new people group, the Christians. Paul was suffering for the Ephesians church members' glory. In fact, in verse 13, this is where he really punches at home. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Don't lose heart. Don't worry about it. Yes, I'm suffering. Don't lose heart. Don't worry about that. It's for your glory. What I'm, what I'm suffering for, you are benefiting from. Your glory. You are receiving glory because of my sufferings. I am, I've been chosen to be a minister of the gospel of God. And I'm out there proclaiming it. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful treat that I get to enjoy, and I'm glad that, uh, that I'm doing it. So don't be sorry. Don't be sad for me that I'm sitting here in prison. Paul was willing to pay any price uh, that this glorious gospel be carried forward. He was boldly living his life. He was proudly doing that. He was doing that. He, he, was, uh, he was living a life. He was living out this boldness that he has, this boldness and access with confidence. You can see that in Paul's life. And he's calling the Ephesian church to, li- to uh, understand this boldness that they now have in their new access to God, access to the throne of God through Jesus Christ. When we, th- when we put all of these pieces together, we see that Paul was willing to pay this price. All of these pulled together, this picture where church is not an optional piece of your walk with Christ. If we are in His church, we are in His church. If we are in Christ, we are in His church. We view church as not an optional add-on to the Christian living, but an essential and life-giving proposal. And that kind of brings us to our take-home truth. When we as the body of Christ, boldly proclaim and live out the gospel, we draw all eyes in heaven and on earth toward Jesus. Think about all of the eyes when they see us proclaiming the gospel, when they see us living these lives. All eyes, when we do it rightly, all eyes go to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank you for, for this. Thank you for this message. Uh, Father, today we don't tiptoe in before you. We aren't timid today. We're not nervously coming uh, in prayer as we pray to you today. We are boldly coming before your throne. We come to you not in our own accord. If we were to do that, of course, rightly, we would be in doubt and fear and trembling, but instead we come boldly to you through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would... Help us see the opportunities opportunities to witness boldly in Christ. I pray that we are carrying this message, that we are living this life, that we as a church are living strong lives, that we are interconnected, that we are loving each other, that we are loving others around us to to share the good news. Father, I pray that uh, in all of this uh, multi generational, multicolored, multi-ethnic church that we all are a part of, I pray that, that that is part of our witness to the world. Let us always re- remember that there are many eyes watching us, both here on earth and in the heavenly places. May all of our actions draw people to you through your Son, Jesus. It's in His name that we pray. Amen. Uh, It's now at this time that we will enjoy communion. If you have not had an opportunity yet, please grab elements that are at the table and uh, we will partake together.
communion, what this allows us to do is to, to remember. We remember where the boldness that we have comes from. Again, it's the body of Jesus Christ. The bread represents His body that was given for us. His payment on the cross for our sins is what makes us right. This is our boldness. As we, as we think about the body of Jesus Christ, He is our great high priest. That's how we can, we can boldly come to God. We know that atonement was rightly made for us. We don't have to, to be nervous about whether that atonement was made right or whether the sacrifice was just perfectly done or not. We don't have to live underneath that. We, we know that we have the perfect great high priest. What we have in our hands right now is a symbol of that. Take church and eat. And the blood represents, the cup represents the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant in Jesus Christ, in our great high priest. Not only is, our great, is He our great high priest, He is our atoning sacrifice. It's not a, a, a bull or a goat or anything like that. It was the Son of God Himself that sacrificed for us. Take church and drink. Father God, thank You. Thank You that we have the opportunity to be reminded of the payment that was made. The perfect price. We do serve the great high priest who is right now sitting at Your right hand. He has made atonement for us. He ministers for us. These are not things that have just happened years ago. This is... Uh, he sits there on the throne today. Thank you, Father. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now would you join me in standing and singing our last song. <laughs>